Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things nuclear from a different perspective. My name is Libby Halevi. I am the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when those nuclear so-called experts get it wrong. This week, a powerful extended interview with Bruce Gagnon of Global Network Against Weapons and Nuclear Power in Space. It's about just that, weapons and nuclear power in space, what has already been planned for our future, set up, implemented, and is being built upon to nuclearize the final frontier. This is hands down one of the most powerful interviews I have ever conducted for Nuclear Hot Seat. Plus, we will have our regular feature, Numbnuts of the Week, for outstanding nuclear boneheadedness. The nuclear reactor, Doc! And cover report on what's gone wrong this week with those aging rust buckets. And more honest nuclear information than both vice presidential candidates combined are likely to mention on tonight's debate. All of this coming up in just a few moments. Today is Tuesday. October 4th, 2016, and here is the week's nuclear news from a different perspective. At the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant in Carlsbad, New Mexico, a portion of the underground ceiling collapsed, in part because no workers have been able to get in to do maintenance on the ever-sinking salt mine construction. On September 23rd, the Department of Energy released an updated assessment of the construction status of the MOX fuel fabrication facility at the Savannah River site in South Carolina. It is intended to convert several dozen metric tons of surplus plutonium from retired nuclear weapons into fuel for nuclear reactors. However... However, a joint study by the Department of Energy and Army Corps of Engineers finds systemic problems, cost overruns, and delays, and now it is estimated that the construction is going to cost $17.2 billion. It currently is only 28% completed, and it won't be done until, at the earliest, 2048. Nuclear reactor duck (laughs) and cover report. On October 3rd, at the Columbia Generating Station in Washington State, there was loss of secondary containment vacuum for four minutes, an event or condition that could have prevented fulfillment of a safety function needed to control the release of radioactive material. (coughs) At Farley in Alabama on October 1st, an automatic reactor trip which forced the plant into hot standby. (coughs) On September 29th at Browns Ferry in Alabama, A licensed operator showed up drunk. (coughs) And at Arkansas Nuclear on September 29th, there was a leak on decay heat removal piping due to a weld failure on a one-inch common pipe. This is another loss of safety function condition. Compensatory measures in place include an individual posted to watch the pipe in case plugging is necessary. Ah, the old finger-in-the-dike routine. (coughs) As regards the USS Reagan sailors, covered in nuclear hot seat number 272, the Ninth District Court is kicking the case to the State Department before they come to a decision. This despite the fact that last December, the State Department, Solicitor General, Department of Justice, Department of Defense, Homeland Security, everybody came together and said, yeah, the case could go ahead. Too hot to handle? In Japan, on September 28th, The country signaled that it would scrap a costly prototype nuclear reactor that has operated for less than a year in more than two decades at a cost of 1 trillion yen, which is almost 10 billion U.S. dollars. The Manju Fast Breeder Nuclear Reactor was designed to burn plutonium from conventional reactors to create more fuel than it consumes, but it seems the Fast Breeder was really a slow breeder. A Canadian federal watchdog has issued an urgent call to the country's nuclear regulator to tighten inspections of Canada's nuclear power plants, calling the situation not acceptable. Commissioner of Environment and Sustainable Development Julie Gelfand said on October 4th that 75% of site safety inspections were carried out without an approval guide and that, quote, 
These mistakes should not happen when we are dealing with nuclear power plants. And now... Nuclear hot seed, none that's sound a week. On September 22nd, French nuclear regulator ASN released an update about defects, quality control problems at the type of nuclear power station the UK wants to build for Hinkley C. An independent consultant issued a 49-page scathing analysis of the defects and quality problems related to this nuclear power station type. So one week later, what happens? The UK signs the contract to have Hinkley Point nuclear power built. And that's why whoever was in charge of that decision in the UK, you are this week's Nuclear Hot Seed, none that sound a week. We'll have today's featured interview in just a moment. But first, thanks to everyone for last week's deluge of birthday greetings that I received via Facebook. After the counter hit 200, I stopped counting and just reveled in this outpouring of support. And deep gratitude to the birthday gifts I received in the form of donations to Nuclear Hot Seat. You know, every donation was the right size, the right color. It fit perfectly. And it will all go towards keeping you in the know with verifiable news on nuclear issues. So if you wish to support the show, consider giving a belated birthday gift or an unbirthday gift, otherwise known as a donation, to help keep Nuclear Hot Seat going and growing. We make it easy for you. Just go to NuclearHotSeat.com and click on the big red Donate button. You can't miss it. PayPal, debit, or credit cards accepted. Or if you prefer to donate by check, send an email to info at NuclearHotSeat.com and we will get you a snail mail address. Whatever you can do to help support this show, Please know in your hearts that I am really grateful. As regular listeners to this show know, I've tended to focus on nuclear reactors and the devastating impact of the entire nuclear fuel cycle, what I've started to call the nuclear fool cycle. I've avoided going into nuclear weapons, not because they're not the ultimate terror on this planet and have scared the bejesus out of me since I was a child in the 1950s, but because the subject seemed so overwhelming, dealing with politics, governments, military priorities, budgets, and much, much more. So except for an occasional news story, I've focused on reactors and the nuclear fuel cycle, from uranium mining all the way to what the industry tries to do to cover up or ignore the nuclear radioactive waste that everything they do leaves behind. But today's interview blows that resistance to covering weapons to smithereens. I spoke with Bruce Gagnon, the Secretary Coordinator of Global Network Against Weapons and Nuclear Power in Space. He's one of the hearts and minds behind the Keep Space for Peace Week activities being held right now, October 1 through 8, around the world. Bet you didn't know about that. Because with all of my contacts, I didn't know about it until a Nuclear Hot Seat listener made me aware. In this extended interview, Bruce talks about planned nuclearization of space, the use of nuclear reactors instead of rockets, the satellite network already in place to manipulate nuclear war on Russia and China, and at the end, he shares a vision for how all the major social and environmental justice movements need to come together to achieve one action for the good of all of us. Bruce and I spoke on Monday, October 3rd, 2016. Bruce Gagnon, welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat. Thank you. Great to be with you. Let's start off with you telling us a little bit about your background and how you got involved in nuclear issues. Well, I grew up in a military family, an Air Force family, m moving around the world, living on military bases for the first 18 years of my life. And then in, uh, actually in 1968, when I was 16, we were living in the panhandle of Florida, so conservative there, they call it Lower Alabama. And I had my first organizing experience working on the Nixon campaign for president. I was the vice president of the Young Republican Club in Okaloosa County, Florida. 
And I did such a good job working on that campaign. They asked me to sit at the head table with their guest speaker right before the election at a fish fry. And so it was uh, none other than Strom Thurmond, the former senator from South Carolina, the arch racist conservative. So this is how I got started in politics. And then in 1971, after graduating high school, I tried to join the Air Force. I wanted to be like my dad, a career man. It was the only thing I knew. I flunked my induction physical because of an old high school football injury. So I had to get a waiver to get into the military when most people were trying to stay out. And after my training, I was sent to a base in California, Travis Air Force Base, that was an airlift base for the war in Vietnam. And GIs would come from all over the country, get on the plane, go to Vietnam. And when the planes would return, they would bring the body bags of the dead soldiers and the walking wounded. And uh, there were a lot of protests outside the gate of our base uh, on the weekends. But also, as it turned out, in the barracks, my first roommate happened to be one of the organizers in the GI resistance movement. So at night, there would be a knock on the door, and white guys would come in with chairs and sit in a circle, and they would talk about the war in Vietnam. I'm sitting in the corner, young Republican for Nixon from a military family, thinking, oh, my God, these have to be communists. Another night, there was a knock on the door, and it was black guys, Black Panthers from the cities, talking about racism in the military, racism across the country. And again, I'm sitting in the corner. But slowly... My uh, chair inched into their circle. I had a good heart. I was an inquisitive person. I was just ignorant. You know, I always like to say that we are what we're programmed to be. You know, lift the lid on your brain, pour, close the lid. And there I was, a young, ignorant, militarist Republican. Uh, and, uh, but it was through life experience that I began to change. And within about six months after being in that room, I became a peace activist. And so my three and a half years in the Air Force, for me, was like doing a hard time. Because once I began to really figure out what was going on, it was extremely hard for me. And then after I got out, I was going to college at the University of Florida, just ready to graduate, where I got recruited by the United Farm Workers Union, Cesar Chavez's union, to organize fruit pickers in Florida. So they trained me, this was 1978, they trained me to be an organizer. I did that for a couple of years and then went on to work in other social justice efforts. And then in 1983, living in Orlando, Florida, uh, I became a full-time peace activist. And who were you a full-time peace activist for? Well, let me first tell you a story that kind of informs my space work today. On June 12, 1982, there was a massive protest in New York City, almost a million people there. Our friend Dr. Helen Caldicott was there as well, one of the leading organizers and speakers and drivers of the freeze campaign in those early 80s. The idea of stop building nuclear weapons, freeze where we are on all sides. So anyway, I didn't go to that protest, but I was watching it on C-SPAN. They were covering all of the speakers. And after it was over, they switched to a right-wing conference. And the speaker at that event was Ronald Reagan's head of SDI, Star Wars, a guy by the name of Lieutenant General Daniel Graham. And during the Q&A after his speech, somebody in the audience raised their hand and said, General Graham, they say there's almost a million people in New York today protesting against nuclear weapons. Aren't you worried about that? And he said, no, I think it's fantastic. Because we're moving into space, they don't have a clue. Let them keep working on nuclear weapons. We're going around them. And it was in that moment, living in Orlando, Florida, about an hour away from the Space Center, that I began to pay attention. So in 1983, I went to work for the Florida Coalition for Peace and Justice that I coordinated for 15 years. And so over and over again, over the years, I kept taking people to the Space Center where we protested spy satellite launches, first test of the Trident II nuclear missile, and successive launches of plutonium into space by NASA. A very dangerous operation because if there was ever a launch pad explosion or explosion soon after launch, this plutonium would very likely rain down on the planet below. And so it was in that job that ourselves and our friends in Colorado 
a group called Citizens for Peace in Space. We were about the only two local groups in the country at that time in the early 80s working on these space issues. And together, along with the journalism professor, Carl Grossman from New York, we created the Global Network Against Weapons and Nuclear Power in Space in 1992. So tell us, what is Global Network Against Weapons and Nuclear Power, and what are its goals? What does it aim to do? As we approached uh, the creation of this organization in 1992, we were looking out around the world and seeing that the U.S. Space Command had created bases, what are called bound link stations, all over the planet, up in Yorkshire, England, out in the middle of the bush country, in the middle of Australia, and many other places around the world. There were these down link stations that talk to the satellites as the satellites orbit the Earth. And they relay signals from that part of the Earth to the satellite back to the United States, back to Space Command headquarters. And so we uh, said, this thing's getting bigger than we ever realized. We've got to really internationalize this whole space issue. And so that's why we created the Global Network, in order to internationalize the consciousness about the plan to control and dominate space, as is stated in the U.S. Space Command planning documents like Vision for 2020. You can find these on our website, Space for Peace. Dot org spaceforpeace.org if you go there. Uh, in addition, they talk about the U.S. will control and dominate space. We will deny other countries access to space. So here we are, 5% of the world's population. We're going to be the master of space. And in fact, that's the official logo on their uniform. It's on their headquarters building at Peterson Air Force Base in Colorado Springs. And so our goal initially was to help create a constituency around this country and around the world that would begin to understand that, oh, my God, the freight train's coming. We've, we've got to deal with it quickly. Put your ear to the railroad tracks and hear it coming. How did you proceed to build this movement? Well, we began traveling. We began going to these various countries and meeting local peace groups. We discovered that in all these places, there were local peace groups that were very isolated uh, they were working on this issue kind of on their own, and, and they knew things we didn't know. We brought them information that they didn't know. And so we began every year organizing an international conference, space conference, in these different places. And each year we would bring people from other places to England, or we'd bring them to Australia, we'd bring them to Germany, to Japan, to, you know, to Korea, to places around the United States, in order to get these various players from small local peace groups to know each other. And through that, we built and built and built the infrastructure of the global network to where today it's a much larger organization. How big is it and how many members do you have in terms of organizational entities or countries? We have 150 organizations from virtually every continent on the earth. Many of them are small, many of them are large. In England, for example, the largest peace group in England, and I'm told in all of Europe, is CND, the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament, uh, in England. And they're a member. In fact, the chairperson of CND is also the chairperson of the Global Network. So um, we have both large and small members. But when you add up the entire memberships of all of our member groups, it's quite a large constituency around the world. And every year as we organize our annual Keep Space for Peace Week in early October, right now it's happening October 1st through the 8th, and so demonstrations and other kind of public events, conferences, things like that are being held around the world in 11 countries this year during this Keep Space for Peace Week, one of our other strategies, having a week of activities to illuminate for other people some of the things that are happening around the world. Uh, on my blog, which is called Organizing Notes, if you just Google Organizing Notes in my name, Bruce Gagnon, you'll find my blog. And there you'll see I'm daily now adding pictures and a video today from Mauritius, uh, where people were moved off of the well-known U.S. base, uh, secret base called Diego Garcia in the Indian Ocean, were moved to a place called Mauritius, 1,200 miles away where they live in utter squalor 
They were just abandoned with no future. And uh, after they were kicked off Diego Garcia, so the U.S. could have a secret base there that is a major power projection hub for our wars in the Middle East. But also, it's another one of these places that has these space downlink stations located there as well. One of the things that motivated me to contact you immediately once I got it was that one of the listeners to Nuclear Hot Seat sent me a list of the events that were planned for this week. There were 50 separate events for Keep Space for Peace in countries including Australia, South Korea, India, Germany, Italy, Sicily, England, Sweden, Norway, here in the States in Washington, D.C., and states all over the country. This is a massive international display coordinated at the same time. And yet, I hadn't heard anything about it through the nuclear news network, nor have I heard anything in mainstream media. What problems have you faced in getting the information out? Well, you know, back in the early 1980s, when we first, when I first got started while working for the Florida Coalition for Peace and Justice, when I first got started working on space issues, we would actually get some coverage. This was at the time that Ronald Reagan announced Star Wars, SDI, Strategic Defense Initiative. But that was a time when the media was much more diffuse across America. The ownership was not so consolidated. In fact, I'll never forget during those days in the early 80s, uh, when the Congress was pumping massive money into the SDI budget, the Star Wars budget, one of the network TV news stations I don't remember which one it was now, but on the nightly news, they did a story about a factory that had been built to make space warfare technology. And they went inside and said, there's nobody doing anything. All these guys are sitting around doing nothing because uh, the technology is not yet advanced enough that they can't find enough work for all the people that they've hired with this money. And so... What we learned from that story was that the weapons corporations were taking this excess profits, this taxpayer money, and buying up media around the country, buying up radio, TV, newspapers. And that really began the consolidation of the media. And so 10, 15 years later, and now fast forward to where we are today, you can't hardly ever get any kind of coverage of these kind of protest events. Uh, because the media is consolidated in the very hands of these corporations that now, as you know, have these interlocking boards of directorates. So whether it's media, pharmaceutical, insurance corporations, weapons industry, oil corporations, banks, they all are essentially the same. They have interlocking boards of directorates. It's consolidation of power, consolidation of media control in the hands of the 1% as the Occupy movement really brought to us. So that's the problem we face today. So we have to use uh, social media and other means in order to get the word out about these things. So it's no coincidence then that you and a lot of other people don't hear about things like Keep Space for Peace Week. And that's why we urge people to go to our website, go to my blog, and find out about these things and help pass on that information. When people say, what's the one thing I can do to help? That's always the first thing that comes to mind. Help us spread the word. It's something you can do. It's something that we're doing right now. That's right. So when we're talking about weapons in space, are we talking purely nuclear weapons or there are others as well? Well, they're working on many, many, many different kinds of things. At one point in time, they were working on a thing called the space-based laser that would be powered by nuclear reactors, giving uh, the reactors giving a burst of energy to fire a laser. But they discovered that the laser beam would be erratic in space, and it, it was going to be used to knock out other countries' satellites and hit targets on the Earth below. But the laser beam was not steady through space, so... They kind of moved away from that. So today, their big emphasis is a program called missile defense. And the idea, uh, it should be called missile offense because it's a key element in U.S. first strike attack planning. Let me kind of illustrate. Every year, for many years, the U.S. Space Command holds a computer war game where they practice 
a U.S. first strike attack on Russia and China, set in the year 2017. And in this attack, the United States sends the military space plane, what's now called the X-37, the successor to the shuttle that proved it could stay in space for an entire year. It's like a super drone, if you will. It looks like a miniature space shuttle. The space shuttle has been retired, you probably remember. And this a military space plane was created in its place. So in this uh, war game, the X-37, the military space plane, flies down from orbit, drops an attack on Russia and China, and then other weapons are used, nuclear weapons by the United States and other uh, bombers, all kinds of things. And they try to take out the underground nuclear weapons of Russia and China. Russia and China then try to fire their remaining nukes after they've been hit in a retaliatory strike. And it is then that these so-called missile defense systems are used as a shield to pick off the retaliatory strikes coming from Russia and China. So this is the primary program today that the Space Command is working on, as well as cyber warfare, which I'll talk about in a moment. But uh, missile defense systems are now being put on Navy Aegis destroyer warships that are actually built in my hometown in Bath, Maine, here in my town. Uh, we just had a Space Week protest in front of Bath Iron Works on Saturday, this particular Saturday. In addition, the United States is putting these destroyers with missile defense interceptors on board. We're putting them along the coasts of Russia and China. They're going into the Black Sea near Russia. They're going into the ocean up and down the coast around China. At the same time, ground-based versions of these missile defense systems are being deployed in various countries, recently put into Romania with a radar, a missile defense radar in Turkey, and next year the U.S. is building a missile defense base in Poland. And so add to that NATO's expansion towards Russia, Russia is now being militarily encircled. At the same time, the United States is deploying these so-called missile defense systems in South Korea, Japan, Okinawa, Guam, Taiwan, and again on these Navy Aegis destroyers up and down the coast near China. This is what's forced China to say that you know, they don't have any bases outside their own country. So recently they've been building in a couple different little islands military bases because uh, they're feeling a bit closed in because Obama and Hillary Clinton, as Secretary of State, announced a U.S. pivot into the Asia-Pacific region, moving 60 percent of our military forces into the Asia-Pacific in order to encircle, again, both Russia and China in that region. Because, you know, Russia, that country is so big, it, it goes from Europe all the way over to Asia. It's that large. So, so anyway, as a result of this missile defense deployments by the United States, Russia and China, both for several years, the last five, six years or so, have been saying, look, we can't afford to discuss nuclear disarmament anymore. We can't afford to reduce any of our nuclear weapons stocks because of your missile defense deployments. So therefore, all negotiations for nuclear disarmament are off until you stop with your missile defense encirclement of our countries. Now, years ago, missile defense used to be illegal, and the United States and Russia had a treaty called the ABM Treaty, the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty, that said neither side could do research, development, testing, and deployment of missile defense systems because whoever developed missile defense would have an advantage over the other. Thus, it's a destabilizing program. But when George W. Bush became president in 2001, one of the very first things he did was withdraw the United States from that ABM treaty. And he escalated the missile defense program. Obama has continued it and moved forward with deployments in a really big way. So it's a bipartisan program. Republicans and Democrats alike fund it and are demanding deployment and encirclement of Russia and China with these missile defense systems. Now, I mentioned cyber warfare. They also discovered 
much to their chagrin at the Space Command, that blowing up other countries' satellites wasn't such a good idea because it creates more space junk, more space debris that eventually could collide even with U.S. satellites, creating a cascading effect. And before long, virtually everything in orbit around the Earth would be smashing into each other at 15,000 miles an hour. A tiny speck of paint becomes a serious weapon that can knock out an entire satellite or something or a, an old bolt or an old piece of a, some a previous space mission could destroy a satellite and more. And so they had to come up with a new idea, a new way to destroy another country's satellite without actually blowing it up. And that's where cyber warfare came from. And in fact, when Bill Clinton was president and he launched the U.S. bombing of Yugoslavia, they did the first cyber warfare test at that time. The United States military actually essentially crawled into Yugoslavia's computers. They hacked them and shut down Yugoslavia's ability to defend themselves from attacks by the U.S. and NATO bombers that uh, bombed Belgrade and other places in Yugoslavia. And so they were defenseless at that point. So that was the first use of cyber warfare. And since that time, the program has been on steroids, receiving huge amounts of money. We're talking hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars. There's no question at all that the United States is the leader in the world in hacking and cyber attacks on other countries. Uh, we're always hearing that Russia hacked the Democratic Party voting list. That's ridiculous. But what we're seeing the Pentagon is doing is constantly accusing other countries of hacking us uh, when, in fact, we're doing a large portion of the hacking in the world. But they use these so-called attacks on us to get Congress to appropriate even more money for the cyber warfare program. So we've come to say that U.S. military satellites in space today that coordinate everything the Pentagon does. They hear everything on the Earth, they see everything on the Earth, and they can fire a weapon at everything on the Earth. Um, these satellites are weapons themselves. They are actually the triggers for modern warfare. When uh, George W. Bush launched the shock and awe invasion of Iraq in 2003, in the initial attack, 70% of the weapons that were used were guided to their targets by U.S. military satellites. So without satellites in space, the triggers, the entire U.S. war machine would not work. So no matter whether you're a troop on the ground, whether you're in a tank, whether you're on a plane, whether you're on a ship, everything that they do today is directed by space technology. Over in Kabul and Afghanistan, when U.S. soldiers are busting down doors in the middle of the night, raiding homes, before they go in, inside of their Humvees, their laptop computer is hooked up to a satellite with high-resolution, three-dimensional maps of every place in Kabul. That's how they're finding people's homes. Everything is connected to space technology today. This is, of course, devastating information because you create a clear picture out of the breadcrumbs that have been scattered around that people look at perhaps individually, but not as an overall pattern. There's one question that comes to me, and that is, what is international law when it comes to weapons, particularly nuclear weapons in space, and does it hold water at all? Well, there are two treaties. One is the Outer Space Treaty, and the other one is the Moon Treaty. The Moon Treaty says there can be no military bases on the moon, and nobody can claim ownership of the moon. The U.S. never signed the treaty, has always refused to sign the treaty, because ever since the 1950s, the U.S. has dreamed of the day when they would have actually military bases on the moon. There's a uh, book called Military Space Forces in the Next 50 Years, published in the 90s, that lays out that whoever controls the Earth-Moon gravity well, think of it like a wishing well. Imagine someone is down inside of the well and you're at the top. They can't get out because you essentially control the front gate or the top of the well. Well, it's the same with 
between the moon and the earth. It's a gravity well. We're at the bottom of the well here on earth. In order to get off the earth, we have to go up through the well. And so if you control the moon and control the what they call the L4 and L5 positions on either side of the moon, you literally control who gets on and off the planet Earth. So the U.S. never signed the moon treaty. The Outer Space Treaty says there can be no weapons of mass destruction in space. That was signed in 1967. When that was signed, both the U.S. and Russia were worried about, or the Soviet Union at the time, were worried about either side blowing up nuclear weapons in space. So that treaty was created. But it doesn't affect the newer technologies. It doesn't touch cyber warfare. That's not a weapon of mass destruction. The uh, military space plane, according to the lawyers at the Space Command, it's a weapon of selective destruction and therefore falls outside of that outer space treaty. And so that treaty needs to be updated. So for the last 15 or so years, Russia and China annually have gone to the United Nations and introduced a resolution calling for a new treaty, the Prevention of an Arms Race in Outer Space, PAROS, P-A-R-O-S, Prevention of an Arms Race in Outer Space. U.S. and Israel annually vote no at the General Assembly in the United Nations. U.S. refuses to even sit down and discuss it. And the official policy through Bill Clinton and before him, Daddy Bush, Bill Clinton, George W. Bush, and now Barack Obama. It's the same under Republican and Democratic presidents. They say this, there are no weapons in space, therefore there's no problem. We don't need a new treaty. And so the United States is obstructing the development of a treaty to ban any kind of weapons in space. So there is no coherent law today. Another reason why the United States does not want space law is because they want to go out and mine the sky. The corporations are now realizing that there's gold on the asteroids, there's magnesium and cobalt and uranium on Mars. The reason why those little rovers, powered by plutonium, by the way, are driving around Mars, they're not looking for the origins of life. They're doing mapping and soil identification of Mars in order to someday have mining operations. There's a magazine called Petroleum News, and some years ago, they had an article about Halliburton. We've all heard of Halliburton. They built a drilling rig to begin the mining of Mars. And so these plans are literally underway. And so they're working on the rocket technologies today to be able to go out to Mars or other planetary bodies. The moon, they say there's water on the moon, there's helium-3. And so they're anxious to get and control these planetary bodies. And inside this book that I referred to a moment ago, Military Space Forces, the next 50 years, in there, this was written by a congressional staffer, by the way, he reported to Congress that with our bases on the moon and with our armed positions on either side of the moon, essentially armed space stations on either side of the moon, we would be able to hijack rival shipments upon return. So if some country that was not authorized to go out and mine the sky, if they tried to come back with some resources, we'd be able to hijack them because we controlled the pathway, the gravity well between the Earth and the moon. So these are the kind of things, the larger issues that are looming in our near future. And the goal now is to, again, create the space technology to go out and do these kind of mining colonies. And they're selling it as, oh, excitement, we're going to Mars, you know, and all this kind of stuff. But it's really about corporate profits and controlling the planetary bodies to the benefit of the corporations. So one of the jobs then of the U.S. Space Command, is not only to control the Earth on behalf of corporate capitalism, but also literally to control the heavens on behalf of corporate capitalism. You know, the image that keeps coming to me is from Star Wars, the movie, that we are the evil empire. How accurate might that analogy be? Well, I know this is, for many people, hard to swallow, 
and I understand that. I used to be a young patriot myself, growing up in a military family, a young Republican for Nixon in 68. But, you know, what finished me off was while I was in the Air Force in the 70s, reading the Pentagon Papers, the famous secret history, the government's own secret history of how they fabricated the pretext for the war in Vietnam. The Pentagon Papers released by Daniel Ellsberg, who at that time was working, helping to write these Pentagon Papers at the Rand Corporation. So after I read that, after it was released in book form, while I was in the Air Force, it finished off any illusions that I had about my country. And I would say to you that there is no doubt in my mind that today, any country that thinks it's going to be the master of space, that it's going to control space and deny other countries access to space, and that it's going to use its space technology to control the Earth on behalf of corporate globalization, to me is in fact the evil empire. I call them pirates. And let me say this. The Pentagon for a long time has been saying that all of this space technology together will be the largest industrial project in the history of the planet Earth, costing so much money that they have to come up with a dedicated funding source to pay for it. And some years ago, in a weekly aerospace industry publication called Space News, they said, look, we understand that we've got to be good corporate citizens. We've got to come up with a dedicated funding source in order to pay for Star Wars, all of this space technology. And we have, they said. And we are now sending our lobbyists to Washington to secure that funding source. And you know what they said it was? The entitlement programs that officially in America are Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and what's left of the welfare program after Bill Clinton got finished with it. These are the programs that the aerospace corporations have identified for defunding in order to pay for their Star Wars program. So that means that the American people will be like the uh, slaves working for the pharaohs, building these pyramids to the heavens for the 1%, while the 99% literally lives in squalor and turns over their hard-earned tax dollars to these weapons corporations so they can go out and control the heavens. It is like a bad Star Wars movie. This is mind-boggling information, but you're giving like a unified field theory of all these disparate pieces that have been floating around that haven't made any sense. And unfortunately, you're making sense that's not particularly comfortable or easy to hear, but is important to know. And I think the listeners of this show are up for it. At least a lot of them are. Everything that I've said so far, I have documented. The journalism professor, Carl Grossman, that was one of the founders of the Global Network, taught me years ago to be able to prove everything I'm saying about this stuff. And we made a video, and it's called Arsenal of Hypocrisy. And I urge everyone to just Google it. It's on YouTube, Arsenal of Hypocrisy. Go there, watch it. We illustrate with documents, with video footage, everything that I've said so far and more. And you get the whole picture of this entire program. Given your clarity and your depth of knowledge of this and your history with these issues, is there anything that we can do? Is there any step, any movement, any action that can be taken to possibly derail this? I believe that we do have a serious problem today, and it's called climate change, and that we must immediately call for a transformation of our fossil fuel culture in America and around the world. We've got to be getting rid of our gas-guzzling cars, our polluting cars, and moving to a public transit system that rivals any in the world. Think of the jobs created if we did that. We need to be putting solar on every house and business in America. Solar works here in Maine. 
It certainly would work in Florida, Nevada, New Mexico, Arizona, and all over the country, California. Think of the jobs created in manufacturing, installation, repair of a solar society, tidal power here in Maine. Think of that. Wind turbines, offshore wind. They say the Gulf of Maine, just a couple miles from my house here in Maine, has more wind than any other place in America. We could have offshore wind farm. And the Norwegians actually wanted to come and build one there, but our Republican right-wing crazy governor in Maine chased them off and instead laid pipe through the state to bring in fracking natural gas from places like North Dakota. So we've got to call for the conversion of the military-industrial complex. We have to demand it repeatedly in order to build this kind of sustainable society. But where's the money going to come from to do that? It's got to come from the Pentagon. We don't need any more endless war. In fact, the military is the biggest polluter on the planet. Did you know that when the Kyoto Protocols were uh, negotiated around climate change, uh, that the Pentagon, U.S. demanded that the Pentagon be excluded from being measured under the Kyoto Protocols because the Pentagon's the biggest polluter on the planet. And so we've got to stop the warfare system. We've got to stop the Pentagon and convert the military machine. And that's our way out. Studies by the University of Massachusetts at Amherst Economics Department say that if we were to convert the shipyard in my hometown here in Bath, Maine, stop building destroyers with missile defense systems on it, and instead build rail systems, we would double, double the jobs at Bath Ironworks. Imagine that. Everybody's worried and wondering about jobs. How are we going to create jobs? If we convert the military industrial complex, build solar and wind and tidal power and rail, we'll double the jobs and do something possibly to help a little bit alleviate for the coming ravages of climate change. We don't have much time. But this should be a unified demand of the peace movement, the environmental movement, the social justice movement, the labor movement. It's a win-win for everybody. Convert the military industrial complex, use those resources to repair our broken society. If we don't demand that, I believe we're, we're dead. And in all of this, where does nuclear power come in? With the nuclear industry framing it as the clean, I'm putting this in quotes now, clean green solution to climate change, and the rest of us saying, no, it's anything but. Yeah, nuclear power is not clean and it's not green. Look at Fukushima. Look at Chernobyl. Look at Three Mile Island. But particularly look at Fukushima. And many scientists are saying that the entire world, the entire oceans now, at some level, have been contaminated by the radioactive waste flowing out of Fukushima. So it's insanity to continue to build more nuclear power. And in fact, the aerospace industry views space as a new market for their nuclear power. That's why, again, the rovers driving around Mars today are powered with plutonium. They want to have nuclear-powered mining colonies with nuclear reactors providing power on the moon and Mars and other planetary bodies. They want to build nuclear rockets with nuclear reactors for engines. The nuclear industry views space as a new market for nuclear power. And that's why our name is Global Network Against Weapons and Nuclear Power in Space. A personal question for you, Bruce. This is brain-breaking information for most people, even if they have some orientation to it. And you have been immersed in this field for decades now. How do you do it? And do you ever think, oh, my God, we're so screwed, we'll never turn this around, let's forget about it, go out into the woods and get drunk? <laughs> yeah, the answer is yes. Uh, I have felt that way many times. And... I used to live in Florida for many years, 30 years, and my office at that time was located in the middle of a tree farm in just north of Gainesville, Florida, donated to us by a Quaker friend. He donated us a place to have our office inside of the middle of his tree farm, a very beautiful place. And one day I was feeling just this stress that you were referring to, and he told me, Bruce, 
You can't carry the world on your shoulders. You can't be responsible for everything. You can only do what you can do and do your very best at it. Give it all you have. And you have to let it go at that point. And that was really a liberation, a liberating moment for me. And I was able to really let go of that sense that I had to, you know, try to, you know, save the world. Now I don't have to. I just do what I can do every day. I do as much as I can. And I live with that. Some days it's harder than others, but that was really an important moment for me. And what I've had the great fortune in this job, working with people all over the world. And as you said, uh, during this Keep Space for Peace week in 11 countries, we have people organizing. And I've learned that there are really great people everywhere you go on this planet. And everywhere you go in this country, there are great people working really hard. And that makes me feel less isolated, and it makes me feel more hopeful. And bottom line, there's one other thing about me. I'm very stubborn, and I don't give up. And I have a son. I have a son who's 35 years old and who has just today told me he's getting married on January 7th. And someday he and his fiancé might have a child growing up in this very difficult world as we hit climate change. And so some years ago in 1989, when he was nine years old, I came home from a protest at the Space Center that I was organizing against the first plutonium launch, the Galileo mission. I came home and I walked in the house and my son Julian had on a gas mask. And he said, it's okay, Dad. He's trying to make me feel better, okay? It's okay, Dad. If Galileo blows up, I could just wear this for the rest of my life. And you know, as a parent, the last thing you want is for your child at nine years old to be even dealing with any of this kind of stuff. And in that moment, I tell you that I was more sure than ever that I would spend the rest of my life trying to make sure that these kind of insane things never happen. So I am highly motivated by my son and all of the future generations. You know, the Native Americans said, every decision we make must be based on how it affects the next seven generations. Well, weapons and nuclear power in space or anywhere on the earth are not good for the next seven generations. I think it's up to 7,000 generations when you factor in the half-life of plutonium. And I don't think you could have put that any better. Bruce, for the record, go over again the actions you would like people to take if once they pick themselves off the floor and have gone through their existential crisis after having listened to this, they are ready to take the action that they can take. Where can they get started? First thing you do when you pick yourself up off the floor is think of your children and grandchildren or brothers and sisters. Think of the animals on the planet. Think about the all life forms on the planet, that we are connected to them. We are related to them. And we have an obligation to protect them as we try to protect each other. Uh, secondly, I would ask you to go to YouTube and Google Arsenal of Hypocrisy and watch that video. It's about an hour long, but it tells this entire story with all kinds of documentation. Thirdly, I ask you to spread the message about that video, Arsenal of Hypocrisy, but also about the Global Network website, which is spaceforpeace.org, and my blog, Organizing Notes, where I daily talk about all of these things, what I'm doing, what so-and-so is doing, what our, our friends are doing around the planet, and uh, try to give you more and more information about all of these things, things that are going on and things that you can help do yourself. And lastly, I would say help articulate this demand that uh, we must convert the military industrial complex to sustainable technology and take the money out of the Pentagon, 54 cents out of every discretionary tax dollar that Congress appropriates goes to the Pentagon. It's outrageous. That money should be used for solar and wind and rail and health care and education and fixing bridges, all different kind of things we need in this country. You know, Frederick Douglass at the time of that other dark economic institution called slavery 
said power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did and it never will. So our demand in this time, when the overriding dark economic system is militarism, we have to demand that we convert the military industrial complex and we have to demand it daily of our politicians and it has to become part of our life articulation. Bruce Gagnon, thank you so much for your dedication, your work, your willingness to help us open our eyes and particularly for being my guest this week on Nuclear Hot Seat. Thank you, Libby. Thank you very much. That was Bruce Gagnon, the Secretary Coordinator of Global Network Against Weapons and Nuclear Power in Space, and one of the coordinators of Keep Space for Peace Week. We'll have links up to Global Network, Bruce Gagnon's blog, Organizing Notes, the film Arsenal of Hypocrisy, the Space Program and the Military, as well as a link to Carl Grossman's detailed 2015 Counterpunch article on space plutonium systems. This will all be up on our website, nuclearhotseat.com, under this episode, number 276. Activist shout-out! My thanks to Jan Boudart for the lead to Bruce Gagnon and Global Network. I'd met him at Dr. Caldecott's most recent symposium in New York, and this proved the perfect time to interview him. Also saying hi to attorney Paul C. Carlson Garner for the update on the USS Reagan case and Eileen Mahood Jose for having helped put radionuclides into consideration for inclusion as a chemical of mutual concern between the U.S. and Canada. Activists do all kinds of great things. What have you been up to lately? Here's today's final thought. On July 26, 1963, John F. Kennedy, President of the United States, said, The number of children and grandchildren with cancer in their bones, with leukemia in their blood, or with poison in their lungs, might seem statistically small to some. But this is not a natural health hazard, and it is not a statistical issue. The loss of even one human life, or the malformation of even one baby, who may be born long after we are gone, should be of concern to us all. Our children and grandchildren are not merely statistics towards which we can be indifferent. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, October 4, 2016. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled from miningawareness.wordpress.com, currentargus.com, allthingsnuclear.org, capecodtimes.com, cbc.ca, akinstandard.com, en.rfi.fr, timesofindia.indiatimes.com, uk.reuters.com, deunrenard.wordpress.com, nancyfaustandsimplyinfo.org, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and the SMART good-looking, above-average souls in the anti-nuclear movement all over the world who gather at Nuclear Hot Seat on Facebook. That's where you are invited to come on down to join us, like us, and share our posts with your family and friends. Theme music written by me, sung by Marilee Weber, accompaniment by John Barnard, recorded at Winslow Court Studio in Hollywood. If you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. We are copyright 2016, Libby Halevi and Hardestry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed as long as proper attribution is provided. This is Libby Halevi of Hardestry Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, reminding you that Nuclear Hot Seat is downloaded in 112 countries. That means we've had our nuclear wake-up call all over the world. So don't go back to sleep, because we are all in the nuclear hot seat. Nuclear hot seat. It's the bomb.